on the new era in geology driven 3D fault and fracture analysis and modeling technology, examples and applications. My name is Muhammad Al Atwa. I am the 2021 DGS Technical Meeting Officer, and it is my pleasure to be the moderator for tonight's webinar. Before we start, we would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor for, the great, for their great support and contribution to DGS. Please note, we will answer your questions after the presentation. So please write your questions in the Q&A session and we will answer them accordingly after our speaker finishes his presentation. And now allow me to introduce our exponential guest, Dr. Jan Peter Van Dyck. But first, let me bring to your attention a summary of his biography. Jan Peter Van Dyck obtained his PhD degree from Utrecht University in the Netherlands and has 28 years of worldwide experience in the oil and gas industry, specifically in new ventures exploration, appraisal, and production in both conventional and unconventional settings. His main professional occupation is prospect generation, which includes seismic mapping, ranking, and risking. Also asset management, research, and technology development. He published numerous research papers and two books on tectonostratigraphy, structural geology, basin evaluation, geodynamics, history of science and technology, and computer modeling. Finally, he is a major expert in fractured and faulted reservoir characterization and model. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Jan Peter Van Dyck, and we are pleased to have you tonight. The floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Can you see me? because my screen is not uh, showing up. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for this uh, invitation and this uh, fantastic opportunity. I will uh, share my screen now and see if the uh, presentation will uh, come up. Here we go. <clears throat> I hope you can all see it. Um, thank you for this opportunity, DGS, for the invitation. And uh, tonight, I would like to speak uh, to you about uh, new developments in um, fault and fracture modeling, 3D fault and fracture modeling. We will speak a little bit about technology I will show some uh, examples and applications, of course. <clears throat> Here is the outline of uh, the presentation. I start with a small introduction. Then we go into the new technologies. Uh, I will show some examples of this modeling and then show two applications. One in Algerian tight gas reservoirs and one in uh, the Emirates in uh, Triassic Dolomites, both related to analogs for subsurface uh, situations. And then we come to some uh, conclusions, of course. <clears throat> Here is the, let's say, the classical workflow we have for the modeling and uh, um, examination of faulted and fractured reservoirs. On the left side, you see the static description. On the right side, you see the dynamic description. So this is a workflow that we have discussed already since uh, 2002. And what we are going to look at uh, today is especially the static description of the reservoir. So how are we going to describe the phenomena we see on different scales and then how are we going to model them into discrete fracture models? In a way, 
to generate value for the right side of the diagram, which is called the dynamic description, dynamic, dynamic modeling, the engineering of the reservoir. Well test, history matching, and of course, all in function of making a, a, a conceptual development plan. How can we use these DN, DFNs, we call them, these discrete fraction networks? Uh, we can not only extract parameters for uh, uh, reservoir modeling, but we also look at uh, discrete flow models, uh, upscaling, and the best way of planning directional wells. Now, let's take a look at fractures and what is the problem with fractures? How do they are, are they presented in nature? with all their complexities, and then how are we going to model them into three dimensions? This is basically a complex problem, because fractures, as you see in these four pictures that I just took in, uh, in, on beautiful pavements in uh, the shopping malls I visited <laughs> over time, here you see that fractures, they cross-cut. <coughs> they can... Uh, terminate against other fractures, <clears throat> they split, they show spacing relationships, swarms, they undulate, and they show open features. But how, how are we going to express all these relationships that we see in nature, these geological features, into a three-dimensional model? This is basically a technological challenge which has only been overcome during the last decade. Now, this is a picture I use since a lo long time, since many years, to express what is basically the characteristics of fractures over scales. <clears throat> The point is, if we look from the left to the right, we see seismic outcrop satellite. You see it in the middle of the, of the slide. Data on image logs, cores, thin sections. We go from larger scale to smaller scale. We always see fractures and faults on a diff, diff, different sizes. They just scale down. We see more of them in the smaller scale. So density is bigger. And <clears throat> we see different types of them. So how are we going to fit all this in one single model? In this picture, and I would not like to go in detail on each of these pictures because basically all of the things I'm showing in this presentation, they have been uh, published. You can download the papers, you can go into detail, anything you would like to know more, you can read through it. This is a sort of a mathematical relationship that the authors in different papers have tried to fit uh, uh, over the years between the over the different scales we observe the features. We can call it power law uh, relationships. Basically from the left to the right in the diagram, you see on the left, the small features that we see of whom we have many. And on the right side, the larger scale features, we have few, but if we look, from, go from left to right, we can say from the smaller we have many, but they are have small openings. And on the right side, we have a few, but they only are open a little bit. So who is contributing to the flow and who is contributing to the porosity, the secondary porosity in a reservoir? Of course, first of all, we must establish if we have a contribution of fracture and faults in the reservoir in a negative sense or in a positive sense. This is <clears throat> sort of a, an example of what we call data-driven modeling. We just model the data that we see. It's a little bit like a seismic interpretation. This is a quarry. You look at the pavement, you look at the walls. Everything you see, you turn into a three-dimensional thing. And this is an example from uh, some time ago in a scientific research project. But if we look over the time, over the years, from the left to the right again, we see small scale and larger scale models which are data driven from core, image log, out, uh, outcrop, satellite, seismic, all kinds of features. Basically what we see is that we go from a smaller to a larger scale. We can fit 
the things we observe into three dimensions. We can convert the observations in a three-dimensional model. We call this a data-driven model. But the problem then is, what is in between? If we look at the different wells of different sizes, di distant from each other, and we can make a beautiful model for what we observe along the well core, how can we correlate the space between the wells? How can we fill it with something? And even if we have a larger scale model on the right side, which is big, large scale features, we can call sub seismic or seismic faults, what is in between them? How do we fill this space? We must make a mathematical model of the things we observe and turn it into a geological three dimensional model. So there have been different proposals over time to do this. I don't want to go again into detail, but look at the three green balls. They, they represent different ways of how people develop this idea. On the top, we have data driven. So we just take the data and we turn it into a model, but then we cannot fill the space. That is the problem. On the lower left, you see the model driven. We basically built a statistical model, a stochastic model. We just fill the space, but then we can say, where are the data? And on the right side, we see a process-driven approach, which starts basically saying, we have a, a situation we deform, we make a geomechanical law and fractures and faults to just propagate through space. But how can we understand through the geological time how these things have developed? What were the stress fields? What were the conditions? So we cannot rely on any of these end member solutions for the model. We must sit somewhere in between. We must use a little bit of the information we have from the data, uh, the processes, how are the geological laws of the features connecting them, but we must put a lot of fuzziness in the model, a lot of statistical variation. So let's go and look at the technological development. Now, here can we see, because something I lived through myself from 1990 to 2020, all kinds of software tools that have been developed and people have done a lot of work and a lot of effort of making tools that, that make fractures and faults in space. But basically, all these models, they were what we call probabilistic. They were driven by a sort of a model idea in space. The data were missing. Maybe the information on the data was there, but not the data themselves. And there was not any geological law. A little bit from one model to the other, everybody seems to do his best. What we are proposing here is what is the DMX protocol, the DEMX protocol. It is a sort of a tool that uses a the laws and the relationships in nature to make a fracture network. Let's take a look at it in more detail. First of all, first of all, we must understand how can we obtain the information to fill this model? How can I make this model? What do I tell this model in space how to do it? Yeah. So we must... <clears throat> I see some message on the blanks on the right screen. <laughs> I hope everybody can see me and hear me. No? So, what is the? how can we obtain information on the fracture network? On the left side, you see the data. We have satellite, graph mark, seismic log, outcrop, core, thin sections, from the larger to the smaller scale. No? <clears throat> In some way, we must analyze them on their orientation, length, height, spacing, truncations. So FMX is just a way of expressing a routine, a series of uh, 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 actions we must do on these data, a series of calculations to understand how are these parameters actually distributed in space. So we extract some information from the model to insert it in the three-dimensional modeling of DEMEX. 
On the base, you'll see the fracture potential in domain modeling protocol, FPDM. Many authors, they speak about this. I developed it in 1995. And since then, there are different variations on this. You just look at the fracture network in 2D and you make a model and try to extend it and extrapolate the densities. But it doesn't really give you a three-dimensional model, but just a variation of the uh, uh, parameters in space. So what is DEMEX? Once we have defined the mathematical relationship of the features, like the length and the, or the sets and orientation, we come to DEMEX. DEMEX is basically a very big uh, computer program, a lot of codes, a lot of files, a lot of commands. And it, what does it do? It makes fractures in space, but using an association of this continuity. So it uses the relationships we see in nature to, to specify a set of dependencies. How are these fractures related to each other? And why is this so? What is the geological law that governs them? And this is of course connected to the processes that made them in the, in the beginning. So we need algorithms to truncate them in three dimensions. We need to relate them to uh, folding, to folds, to slip, to curvature, to all kinds of relationships, spacing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what F De DEMEX does. It, relay, it makes a geological feasible model. <clears throat> Here in this slide, you see very quickly represented on the left, you see the single fracture, it needs properties. It needs the position, it needs a shape, it needs an orientation. And on the right side, you see the depend dependencies because these properties, they depend on something. On, they depend on the other fractures or depends on some geological structure. And on the base, you see statistical laws that govern probabilistic uh, um, elements that govern all these relationships. So it becomes complex, you can imagine. <laughs> so what is the workflow? On the left, we see the data that come in. Then we need to analyze them, the properties, each single properties in the relation to the other fractures. We need to establish a series of function parameters. So we need to make a menu of how the numerical model is going to do this. Then the numerical model, DEMEX, does it work? We cut it and we look and analyze the observations and we confront it with what we saw in the beginning. So what the model provides, does it look like what we observed? And we go back into the model until we are satisfied. And then we can extract the parameters from the model for new ventures, exploration, appraisal, drilling of wells, parameters we want to extract, et cetera. And we can be more confident that what we have done looks actually like the geological reality. So let's look at some examples of the modeling. Quickly, okay, looks nice in three dimensions. Yeah. <clears throat> All kinds of, uh, relationships between the fractures and the faults and the surfaces and the folding. Uh, here we see um, um, one DEMEX model. We can represent it in different ways in space, but look, take a look especially at the image on the top right, which is we, how we, if we cut the model, how would it look like? And actually, if you look at this, it looks realistic. It looks geological. It, it looks as if something happened that makes sense. So the laws that we put in to gen generate these models, they actually generate fraction networks that look realistically. So like as me as a geologist, I can say, oh, now I'm more satisfied. The numerical model looks like something I'm used to see in nature. And I just go through some examples of this. 
Let's say this last example, it, I like it very much. It is the damage zones example. And you see all these little fractures and things and features and cross cutting and zones in space. They really look like the things we are used to see in cores, even in seismic attribute maps. Uh -huh. Okay, we go quickly through two examples. Each of these examples actually has been subject to uh, uh, a paper I wrote for the SPE and presented. This is Algeria. I worked for many years on these two assets. It's tight gas in the Paleozoic. You see a section uh, through the basin. Uh, actually, the, in the black box, we see the asset. It is sort of a bump in the green ones in the lower part of uh, Ordovician deposits, tight quartzites. Here you see some uh, examples of seismic and mapping in the uh, western asset in Algeria. And let's take a look at what is, what is actually the problem here. The problem we have in many tight reservoirs that there is gas coming out, in this case, four millions of scuffs per day, economically not enough. But what we can say is there is something going on in this reservoir that makes us wonder if we can <clears throat> do better. Because if we look at porosity and permeability, it is so very low, you could not even explain this open hole test. There is more gas coming out than you would expect with this very low porosity and permeability. So probably the fracture and fault networks plays a role. So the strategy here was to apply uh, fracking tests and see if we can manage this better. But you need to establish for the frac test some parameters. So look at the fracture network. We see some uh, uh, in seismic attributes, uh, how do things look like? We can analyze it. We build some uh, observations and we start to look at these data sets from the, on the different scales. Here you see uh, seismic attributes. I know my slides are coming up a little bit slower than uh, me, myself, I see them. Let's say uh, in this case, we were, we were lucky because we had a, an outcrop analog. You could see in Google very nice these uh, sections. On the base, we see the Ordovician uh, sandstones. On the top, we see uh, Silurian uh, shales covering them just in Google. And it looks all very... Uh, similar to the subsurface. We see uh, fault and fracture zones, and we can uh, compare it with the logs. We also were very lucky to have uh, in certain areas high resolution uh, satellite images. This is a picture from Google. Well, you see very nicely the things, but if we uh, take a look at what we can do with remote sensing data and better other satellites with higher resolution uh, imaging, we can actually see beautiful pictures of the, of the outcropping and, and anticlines, which were very useful to understand how we could do the seismic mapping. Some other examples. And uh, in this uh, slide, we are going to the different uh, scales we see in the satellite uh, images because the new technologies on remote sensing gives us actually the, uh, a way of imaging from the larger to the smaller scale, the features. If we look at the first picture, we look at, uh, I just go quickly through it. You will come and see it popping up your screen. We go, we zoom in slowly in this picture and we go from a seismic scale to a sub-seismic scale of a few uh, uh, kilometers to a few hundreds of meters. And then in the end, in the last picture, we see the features on a few uh, a meter scale, five meter, 10 meter scale. So basically we can go in a fluent way, fluid way from seismic scale to well scale. Uh, and the enormous advantage we have, we can see the sub-seismic interwell scale. 
And we can represent this in mathematical ways. Here we see a, 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 a diagram. From the left, the many, many small things, and on the right, few large things. But they are governed by the same mathematical laws mechanically. Or let's say not really, because we discovered in this case that the joints were governed by a certain law and the false patterns on the larger scale by a different mathematical law. So we could actually distinguish these things over the scales. Two pictures to show how this was applied. One slide <clears throat> gives you an, an example how we put in the yellow boxes, there are all the numbers, the, uh, let's say the quantification, numerical expression of the different parameters we needed for the modeling. So we see permeability, density, scaling of the features over the different scales. And on the in the base of the slide, we see the porosity and the permeability. Basically, the matrix was uh, one and a half up to 8% was a uh, um, active component of the system and the joint system on in terms of permeability. This is on the well scale. So let's say if we, we compare it with the core data. If we look at the larger scale, the block scale, the scale we were doing the frac test, again, on the lower left, you see the parameters, the numerical expression of the parameters that we used. And in the center, you see the block. But one of the main conclusions was that in this case, we could, the larger scale features intersected more layers in the reservoir. And so with one frac test, we could actually access gas from different reservoir layers uh, connecting these larger features with the smaller features. And of course, in we did three-dimensional modeling of the fracture network to understand how we could uh, plan future, future wells. So let's go to the next example, is uh, in the Emirates, an outcrop scale, a well scale example of information that we acquire. This is a very technical, let's say, exercise on our outcrop to show how we can build quickly a model from uh, three-dimensional data acquired directly on a uh, sample data set. We are talking about a uh, Triassic section in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, the Emirates. It is an, it, this outcrop is an analog of, uh, subsur of subsurface conditions and producing reservoirs. Here we see where it is and what section of the, of the uh, stratigraphy. On the left side, you see a picture. Okay, it could be equally well a satellite, a seismic or a log scale or a outcro an outcrop or a core. This is just an exercise to show how it works on an outcrop. First of all, FMX, we need to acquire the information from the fracture network, quantify it, build a conceptual numerical geological model. And then on the right side, we just put it in the DEMEX protocol and we produce a model. In this case, it is a data-driven model in terms, in sense that all the features we see on the outcrop actually, or on the core slab or whatever, are represented in the model. And we can extract porosity, connectivity, uh, uh, all kinds of parameters we need to characterize this rock. This is, a, of course, a challenge. I always uh, sustain it in 24 hours. We can do one exercise on one feature and generate a 3D model. It is feasible. OK, some examples. Automated coloring of the fracture sets. We have to recognize what fractures are here. Just look at the scale of the model. It is a very small scale model, eh, this example. This is a, a, a fundamental step in the analysis. The how do we actually quantify the interaction between the fractures? I call this the Bix TV analysis. It, many authors have written papers on this. It is a ternary diagram. Basically, we quantify how many fractures terminate against each other, terminate in the matrix, or, or are cross-cutting each other. And we express this in a diagram. So if you see uh, just one observation, you throw it as a ball in the diagram. And you have to imagine that from the top left to the lower right, the connectivity is better. 
you have more fractures and more possibility of connecting and, uh, and make this medium on a scale of fractures more permeable. Uh, in this case, we analyzed uh, statistically and quantitatively uh, the, the contribution of the bedding. Of course, if the bedding was also a contribution in the, in the uh, permeability, we see that the, the ball goes down and uh, the circle goes down in the diagram and uh, uh, is an expression of a better con connectivity. So, in the end, the result of this is a three-dimensional model. What is important to understand is that this looks like many models you will see. But in this case, this model actually has two important characteristics. First of all, it has actually the information that we have observed in the model itself. So the data, the, the traces that we see, etc., they are the seed of growing the model. They are in the model themselves. So we don't miss them, we keep them. The second is that there the fractures, they terminate exactly like we have observed them in three dimension. And this is not a simple thing. This is, of course, high tech uh, computer uh, calculations. Uh, a lot of computer time involved also in these, these calculations, of course. But let's say it is better to generate less fractures with a higher quality than throw in two billions of fractures in a computer and they don't mean anything and they don't talk to each other. Huh? So in the, in the base of the diagram, you see a section through the model, which shows that actually these fractures are realistic. And, and what I did not show, what I don't show in these pictures always is the, the stratification where they terminate against the stratification because this, then we wouldn't see anything anymore, but they are in there. So let's say in the, we see from this picture that it looks really like a, a, a geologically, geologically feasible model. Okay. And from this model, we can extract a series of parameters to use in uh, reservoir modeling. Now, let's look at a few conclusions and where are we now on the technology side. <clears throat> on the technology side, we can say, okay, there are four important things we now know. We can do multi-scale data acquisition and processing. Let's say all the, the there is a hype on remote sensing, and we can actually look from the larger to the smaller scale. Everybody uses Google Earth, and maybe in daily life you like to zoom into the city and to your place, but scientifically this is a breakthrough. This gives us the possibility to examine information from over uh, many scales. Another, of course, important breakthrough is the flying around with drones. We can observe things from different angles. We can make pictures. We can make three-dimensional models where normally we could not go. Second, the data-driven model. We can actually make models now that put, they use the data themselves and use them in the model. Not just here are the data and there is the model and it doesn't. they don't talk. The third one is the DEMEX protocol and the FMX suite themselves. Of course, one is the computer code. One is the, 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 the let's say, the roadmap. How do you do things? Eh? We are decades ahead. And then we have the possibility to combine these model-driven approaches in, in the three-dimensional modeling. So combine the different things in one environment. What are challenges for the future? Of course, we must try to integrate the machine learning and the artificial intelligence in this. In a certain way, we are already doing machine learning and artificial intelligence in our daily work because we do things better when we make mistakes. But there is, of course, an automation process that needs to be implemented. Furthermore, <clears throat> we need to, of course, more and more applications and verifications with subsurface data sets. If the technology advances, we need to see how is the implica implication on the subsurface. And then acquisition techniques are, of course, a major uh, 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 thing we have to follow. Drone laser scans, I already talked about the multi-scale remote sensing, and then especially multi-component 3D seismic, 3D seismic attributes, azimuthal seismic, things of this, like this. We have to work on this to have more and more information on our subsurface conditions. 
analogs that need to be studied to get more and more information on how are these geological laws that we need to, to implement to do the modeling. Some conclusions to close on the applications. How do we use this information? I have been working 25 years on these issues, worldwide applications. We have clear idea on where do we use these data. Porosity, storability, P32, P33, we call this. How much is in the fracture network? How does it interact with the matrix? 3D geometrical connectivity. It is a parameter we call three, P31, you can call it eh, like this. Upscaling for dynamic reservoir simulation. We need to make a nice model, but we, but we need to upscale it to give it to the reservoir engineer. Then we have the discrete flow models, of course. We can make computerized models. It is in the beginning of being developed. And most important, maybe, optimization of well deviations. How would you orient your well in the best way? Many things are going to be an issue. Uh, steering, we need to understand phases, the distributions, we need to understand subsurface stress conditions, etc., etc. Today, I just focus on technology on fracture modeling, not on the whole spectrum, of course, on applications in, uh, in uh, development and uh, uh, appraisal. So, a little bit of publicity. On the right side, you see a map where myself, I already applied many, many of these principles over the years. Let's say on the left, I it's provocative. I would like to put a diagram on um, how can we apply all this fracture and fault modeling. I think it's, we just not should not focus only on conventional and maybe, huh, especially also on conventional EMP on the fracture model. Let's look at groundwater management, engineering, slope stability, carbon capture and storage. Myself, I have worked for uh, many years on a, a research projects on a storing uh, a carbon underground. And of course, issues on uh, storability and maintainability in these reservoirs nuclear waste management and the geothermal energy generation. Let's say for new technologies in um, GNG, there is always a lot of space to apply them in other uh, uh, um, environments, I would say. Hmm? Okay, well, thank you so very much uh, for your attention and uh, I hope you liked it. Thank you for uh, this opportunity and uh, Anything you would like, I mean, more information, please contact me. You want to know more about these papers, you can freely download them. You want to have some more demonstrations, whatever. Please uh, don't feel uh, shy, contact me. <laughs> I'm here for uh, any proposal. And uh, I extend my best wishes uh, already for uh, next week. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jan Peter for uh, joining us tonight. Um, we have room for a couple of questions. Let me put my glasses on. <laughs> Our first question is asked by uh, Mohammed Al-Dhailan. His question is, uh, how can we effectively model natural pressure-induced fractures utilizing data-driven modeling? Data-driven modeling, yes. Yeah. Yes, data-driven modeling, uh... It depends a little bit on your data set. I, I would say the data-driven modeling is especially very attractive for seismic volumes. Let's say many people are speaking about automatically fault generating now eh, in software environments. This is a different thing. This is, of course, generating your fault network that is on the seismic scale. You can visualize it. The fracture and the, the fracture corridors, etc., they are something on the sub seismic scale. So they have a lot of visibility. They have a lot of possibilities of being connected. Let's say that just below what you can be sure that you see. Eh? And there it has a lot of applications, I think, in especially in your uh, um, optimization of the orientation of horizontal wells. That's where I see the more applications. Let's say if you do the data-driven modeling on your core slab, like I saw, I, I showed on the outcrop, that's very nice because then you can actually make your uh, mechanical model maybe, 
Yeah? And you can make your storage model. But on the, let's say, on the larger scale, it would have bigger, more, more impact on your production because your horizontal drains, let's take into account all your uh, uh, image logs, fundamental, of course, and then look at your seismic, uh, sub-seismic scale data-driven model. The one I showed with the two pictures in the, in the, I don't know if you still see my screen. Uh, yes, I we can do. go to the slide that is more has more this one. Uh, <coughs> do you see it? it is coming? So let's say this is a data driven model on seismic uh, attributes, and here there it has more impact because there it makes the difference between finding your productive zone or not. Uh, that's it. Please. Some Thank other question. So much. The, the next question is asked by uh, Paul Gretsch. Uh, he's asking how yeah. do you integrate this fractured model in a static 3D sedimentological model? You, in a static? Yes. Can you repeat in a static? In a static 3D sedimentological model? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, 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 it's very nice, Paul, that for this question, I, I fully agree. I did a lecture on this in uh, actually uh, uh, um, a few months ago that I said there is a challenge in the integration between the stratigraphic trapping and the fracture modeling because we see these are two universes that for the moment not yet speak to each other. I would say that we must, this is a next step we have to do. In the DEMEX protocol, I inserted options to do truncations of fracture models and confine them to zones. So you can actually see, say, okay, I have from my seismic interpretation, I have a idea on a stratigraphic trapping or a certain, let's say a certain carbonate unit that, or, or and maybe it's more fracture related production on the other carbonate unit that is more prosody. Can we actually connect this? Yes, we can. If we have the fracture data on FMI or uh, logs. We have some, some information on the sets that govern. We can actually build these models connecting the, the different stratigraphic units because actually, of course, different stratigraphic units will have a different reply. And this is again a technological issue. For the moment, up to now, it was not possible to define all these boundaries in space and then build a fracture model that is confined to a certain phase. Now we can, now we can. So I think it is a next step which is very important. We should do this. Yeah, we should do this. It has not been done, I must be honest, because we still build fracture models for a certain type of reservoir and then for another one. But if you, now that we can do it, it would be a very interesting exercise to see how this uh, works out. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the next question is asked by uh, John Humphrey. Uh, he's asking any surface exposure of fractures and fracture network at all scales necessarily reflects some amount of unroofing. At what scale do we have confidence that surface expression reflects the subsurface? Yeah, yeah, this is a classical uh, problem. I agree fully. This is something we always must very carefully address. If we have an outcrop analog of a reservoir that we decide this is something that is similar to our reservoir, maybe because the stratigraphy tells us or whatever information we have tells us that we have an analog. Let's say in not only we should always underline why is it similar. We also should make a list like the unroofing and the why is it not similar? There is a lot of diagenetic processes, uh, 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 fresh water flows, carcism, uh, all kinds of conditions that have acted on the fracture network in the surface. So there we must establish 
a sort of a confidence of what do we see in this fracture network, the parameters that are actually similar to the subsurface and which ones we just ignore because this is things that have happened because of the unroofing, because of the uplift. So let's say we must make a, a, a checklist. This is the things that are similar and these are the things that we that are different in this outcrop and then use only the part that we are confident. The stress field has, is of course different. As the geological evolution is never exactly the same. If it would be the same, the, the outcrop would be a reservoir. <laughs> so I agree, there is this issue and we need always to be very careful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question is asked by uh, Alberto Raiva. Uh, he's asking, usually small scale fractures are very numerous and treated implicitly in the fracture models, yeah. as they could be computationally intensive. Yeah. Treated yeah. explicitly, how do you deal with them with your approach? Yeah. So that's that's let's say something I would I must be very honest on this. Let's say that if you look at at um, some you, you can walk around in conferences and you see codes and let's say we can make millions of fractures in the computer. And then we say it's computationally very complex. If you do for a reservoir, one million fractures, you have nothing. You have for one square meter, you have maybe a fracture, eh? or one cubic meter. So it doesn't really show you anything, even if you, so you, let's say that we must not now today try to focus on making fractures from the centimeter scale and fill the reservoir. That would, for the moment, of course, computationally, even if we put all the, the whole cloud and all the surface <laughs> in connection, we would not be able to do it. So the, we have to cope with the capability of technology, but on one side, I am very, I am positive because I say technologically, we are so far ahead that we can do things now, but then I speak about the relationships. So all these algorithms that truncate the fractures that look at their relationship and all how they are connected in the, in the res on, on, on surfaces and, and whatever features and between them especially, they are computationally very complex. So we can make a conceptual model for these complexities on a certain scale. What each situation is different and you have to see how far can I push my computer or my server, how far can I go? I think it is not a solution to say I take my whole reservoir and I, I can model all the fractures in my reservoir. That's nonsense. That, that is like science fiction. Eh? So we have to be realistic on the computational capabilities. But on the, on the other hand, I think on the, on, the, on the speed and on the possibilities that we have today, we must already be very positive because in the last 10 years, we have made such, we made such an enormous leap that we can actually now implement these algorithms that do computations that normally would 10 years ago would have taken a year to solve few of these equations. So we are far ahead, but we are still in the beginning on certain scales. So let's say on a core scale for centimeters, maybe we can do a few uh, a cubic meter, not more, <laughs> and then extract the parameters for our geomechanical model. <laughs> yeah. There are many fractures in a cubic meter. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. We have room for okay. uh, Good. one or two more questions. Uh, our next question is asked by uh, Abdelaziz Masoor. Is, um, he's saying, my question is, can you elaborate on the importance of calibrating fracture models with production, with production behaviors? And what is the impact of integrating fracture modeling on enhancing the recovery, the recovery of hydrocarbon resources? Oh, absolutely. It's fundamental. I've worked in, the, in many, in many, on many reservoirs with this, with this, uh, with this question. The, the enhanced recovery, of course, in, let's put it like this. In certain reservoirs, let's go to the dual porosity case. Huh? In certain reservoirs, we can say, okay, 
a certain point with our platform production, etc., we are comfortable. We are producing from the matrix. We have a, a in a bitch, we have all kinds of things that we can be comfortable that our our uh, model of depletion, etc., works. In a certain point, a certain point in all in all these types of reservoirs, people start to worry, and we have other levels, and we need to uh, consider maybe uh, 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 the fracture uh, contribution, and especially what is the the, the residual reserves in blocks that have remained isolated because fracture networks they know maybe there is also a sort of a misunderstanding they not only enhance productivity they also compartmentalize our reservoir especially in bioplastic uh, sequences i we we discovered uh, uh, it is already 15 years ago or maybe longer maybe 20. we discovered that in bioplastic reservoirs there were damage zones just like in classic reservoirs and things were started to be compartmentalized so Let's say in in this enhanced recovery uh, and uh, water injection exercises, we must look at these fracture networks and these these um, these uh, reservoir compartmentalizations to understand how can we best target these residual reserves and uh, uh, optimize the production. Then, of course, in my lecture, I little I, I spoke a little bit about fra frac jobs in tight class uh, quartzite reservoirs. Completely different because there we try to target the zones that are the, the providing the gas. So it depends all on your case. But I think it's really fundamental, especially in enhanced recovery and uh, <coughs> injection, steam, water, uh, 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 gas injection, anything we are looking at, what is the contribution of these fracture networks, both in a sense of negative and in a positive sense. Eh? We must be very careful. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have room for two questions. Um, we have this question. I'm sure with, with the great efforts you spent on seismic attributes, yeah. fracture and port prediction, two. Two. Uh, you did not miss the new artificial intelligence and um, the fourth industrial revolution solutions. Yeah. So what are the ongoing developments on this regard. Yeah. Let's say artificial intelligence, there's a lot of talking about this. I, I, I fully understand. I have been part of this, I work on this, and uh, I know what all the discussions are. Um, in this fracture, in the fracture modeling and the fracture exercises, this is a new, this is a new thing. It's still not it's still not really introduced. Like I touched uh, in the end, uh, I think uh, somewhere um, <clears throat> in my speech, Artificial intelligence, automation of it in this kind of uh, environments it would be a new step. I have, I have introduced it provocatively uh, a year ago. I said in this, in this loop of sampling a model and then confronting it with what we have as observations, I noticed a few mathematical uh, problems. I am uh, 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 I am fully aware of this because many of the mathematical laws we put in the model to generate the fractures, they interact and they generate a different <laughs> uh, mathematical output just because they interact and they truncate. So I discovered this just because it was capable of doing it, the algorithms. And then we push it back into our observation and we say, yeah, there we need to adapt the model. And there is the machine learning. It needs to learn from his modeling. But this is new. So if somebody would like to sponsor this <laughs> as an R&D, it would be really interesting and a breakthrough because it would be the next step in considering that what we observe in nature and goes back into the model, how we can manage this to make the machine learn to, to optimize the model. So I think this is, a, this is one of the major challenges. And I think this is a very important question. This is a... Uh, um, uh, let's say fundamental that we make this next step. It would be a, a real breakthrough. For the moment, we just sample the model, we look at it, and we say this needs to be adapted, and we try to fit it. But the machine must learn to do this. Huh? Yeah. But I think this is not done. In seismic, it's different, but we are talking about seismic artificial intelligence in mapping seismic attributes and recognition of faults, etc. So what this is what I call a deterministic artificial intelligence, because it looks at features that can actually be fit with a few with a few 
laws that we use as seismic interpreter. We can find the channels, we can look at the faces, we look at the faults, etc. But this is always in the realm of visibility, of things we can actually see. The problem with the fracture networks is that they are below the resolution, so we must fit something that has a much higher fuzziness. So we have to go back to the statistical um, distribution of the data, not so much to how, how good it fits with the things that we can see. You see, there is a little bit, there is a difference. Eh? So this is a new challenge. Yeah, very nice, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, let's say a fascinating <laughs> uh, argument. Oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we uh, run out of uh, time. Sorry for uh, the people. We couldn't answer uh, their questions. Anything, uh, you can, you you can email me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Jan Peter, for the contribution and uh, the informative uh, session. It was uh, our pleasure to have you uh, with us. Okay. Thank you for sharing uh, with us your valuable time and uh, experience. Thank you so very much, and hope to uh, speak with you soon. Super. So, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to thank you all for joining us um, uh, this evening. So thank you so much, and uh, have a great evening. See you soon.